You know, there will come a time, there will come a day when the Lord Jesus Christ, the mind above everybody else's, God himself in perfection will rule the earth. Are you ready? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Embry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we are discovering the Word of God each and every day. It's a really good day to join us now. Corey is going to help us. Corey, what's up? Well, I'm going to be talking about Psalm chapter 45 and smelling good in the ancient world. Ryan? <laughs> well, today in our continuing study on God's creation, we're talking about how the green colors of spring and summer are really just a cover. All right, very good. That, that's smelling good. That's, that's <laughs> mm -hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, I never thought of that. That's very, I don't know, it's fascinating. Anyway, You're going to you find mean? out. <laughs> well, today is our Fun Friday wrap-up, which means that I can ask a question anywhere from Psalm 19 to Psalm 49. Psalm 45, verses 1 through 11. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house, so the king will greatly desire your beauty, because he is your Lord. Worship him. Psalm 45, verses 1 through 11. You know, the glories of Messiah are something else. We study the Psalms. Today we're looking at in our collection of scripture we're going through this year, Psalm 45 to 49. And today we study Psalm 45. It, it really is amazing, isn't it? I mean, the, the second coming of Christ should be a consistent theme for believers everywhere. Second coming of Christ. I mean, it should underpin our thoughts and our behavior. His promise to return should resound in our ears when we ponder the moral direction of how this world is moving. Soon Jesus Christ will return and ready or not, he will overtake and rule the nations. I think the best way to handle this is to quote to you directly from the scripture, my favorite scripture, one of my favorite scriptures in the whole book of Revelation. Quote, now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and his righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like the flames of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was loathed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies in heaven clothed in fine white linen, clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword and with it, he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them 
with a rod of iron. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 15. What, 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 what an amazing passage of scripture. I just get so inspired uh, when I read that, when I think it through. And I, I wonder if, if you've ever read that, because that's very, very important. Now, let me just say that, get your Bible out and turn to Psalm 45, because the coming of Christ, we're going to talk about that today. You know, the Psalms covers a lot of things. We're going to just touch on it. And the coming of Christ is very, very exciting. The problem is, I can say the coming of Christ, and a lot of, a lot of people will just be totally out to lunch with this because they believe this, they believe that. I'm just saying what the Bible says. That's what I, I don't subscribe to anybody's belief. I subscribe to what the Bible says. <laughs> that's, that's how I believe. And you know, when we look at this, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, help us. Help us to hear your word because your word is so real and true. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Put all the things aside. Let's read the scripture. What does the Bible say? My heart is overflowing with a good theme. It's a good theme. Do you understand? This is a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king, capital K. Very interesting. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon you, your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach your awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, and the peoples fall under you. There is no question God will rule the earth soon. We must be ready and we must be ready now. Let me tell you something. There is no question that the Psalms is talking about this. And the Psalms speaks about the coming of the Lord and what will happen. I mean, it looks like we're reading out of Revelation, but we're not. We're reading out of the Psalms. The music of God teaches us this. Oh my goodness, this is great. We got to go on. Chapter 45 verse 6 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now listen to this. You love righteousness and you hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, he has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. What's he talking about here? He's talking about Jesus Christ. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia and out of ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. Kings, daughters are among your honorable women and your right hand stands in the queen of gold from Ophir. Oh my goodness. What an amazing statement. Beloved, everyone will be ruled by God's son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. We must get ready. It's not going to be the governments fixing the world. It's not going to be that. It's going to be us listening to God as he challenges and changes everything. I want to tell you something. There's a lot going to happen before then in my view, because I read the Bible, but it's important that we understand when Jesus Christ comes and Israel saved. And when we understand that, what God will do, we are absolutely stunned by the reality of what he's doing. Now, we got to go on because verse 40 or verse uh, 10 of chapter 45 is very interesting. Here, here it is. Listen to the carefully. Listen, O oh daughter, consider and incline your ear, bride of Christ, for your own people also in your father's house. So the king will be greatly, will greatly desire your beauty. Greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Worship him. Worship him. Oh, beloved, listen carefully. We must worship the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. As Christians, our lives and loyalty 
belong only to Jesus Christ. Beloved, I know there's a lot of people who are worshiping today and, you know, they've got smoke machines and lasers and I used to be in television, do all that stuff. And let me tell you something, that's great and all that, but that doesn't cut it. It's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, when He comes into a service. It is the Holy Spirit that makes the difference. The Holy Spirit makes the difference. None of this other stuff does, but the Holy Spirit comes in and totally and completely, totally derails our human thinking. And suddenly what happens is we begin to think about Jesus Christ and we begin to worship God, not all the singing and all the fast stuff, worship God. Father, I pray today that our services in churches would come back to knowing who you are. Many services are, and thank you, Lord, for them. But Lord, there's many churches who've lost it. They've lost the touch. Oh, God, we have to come back. People have to come back to seeking your face, to knowing you and to understanding what you've said. Thank you, Jesus, for all you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. Now we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sin. Help us as we turn from our wicked ways. Help us as we humble ourselves and teach us your way, O oh God. In fact, I pray in the Lord Jesus Christ's name, lead us in your paths. Lord, help us to follow you. In the name of Jesus Christ. And we all said together, amen and amen. In Psalm 45, we read about the scented robes of the individuals involved in Psalm 45. And, you know, there were many different ways to smell good in the ancient world. Uh, perfume, incense, spices, having a bath. There are many, many uh, ways, just like there are today. You know, we like to smell good. Humans like to smell good because we don't smell good naturally all the time many different ways, but I want to focus on one particular way that involves an artifact that was found. Take a look. The late and well-respected archaeologist William F. Albright made many contributions to our knowledge of history, but not all of them were discoveries he himself dug out of the ground. Such is the case with an artifact that sheds light on the day-to-day -day beauty practices of ancient women. Albright began this discovery by re-examining a small box that was found in the Israeli city of Lakish in the 1930s. This cube-shaped box was thought to belong to a classification of ritual incense burners, burners that had use in religious ceremonies or services. The box that drew Albright's attention had an inscription around its size that had been hastily translated as something to do with incense and the proper name of the biblical god, so its connection to religion was assumed verified. Albright's re-examination, however, claimed an entirely different translation. In his reading, the box read, belonging to the daughter of Eos, son of Mali, the royal courier. Supported by other well-respected scholars, this new translation changed the artifact from one with religious significance to one with a different kind of biblical link. This was now a cosmetic burner, meaning a box that fumigated ancient perfume into the pores and clothes of Judean women. Other known cosmetic burners follow generally the same build. They have four legs and a shallow bowl in the top to hold spices. Many found burners have names of spices inscribed on their sides. As to use, Albright cites a 19th century book in which the traveling author describes how Bedouin women tented themselves over a coal fire with spices thrown in, using their outer garments to keep in all the fumes. In this way, he claims that he could smell a group of women from a hundred yards away. 
While this observation was made thousands of years after this personal cosmetic burner was made, it at least provides a link from a comparable culture as to how the boxes may have been used, and it absolutely illuminates biblical passages like Psalm 45, 8, various passages from Song of Solomon, and of course, Queen Esther's year-long beauty treatment that's said to have included six months with perfumes. So there we go. It may not be one of the ways that we today, us moderns, uh, you know, scent ourselves, but nevertheless, we do scent ourselves still, even still. So this is something that connects us uh, with the ancient world. We're all human and we still struggle with the same things, uh, even, you know, things as trivial as how we smell. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you say trivial. I find that fascinating because um, there are things in the Persian culture that we read about in mm -hmm. Esther and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. They were given six months to prepare themselves. We don't think about the smell. And yet at the same time... It's all about the smell. It was, it. It's all about the smell. That was mm -hmm. incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, beauty is like, beauty is an all-encompassing concept. It's not just how you look, it's how you present yourself and how you smell and how you speak and your posture and all of that, <laughs> all of that stuff that is superficial, but is still important to us as humans. And with, right? you know, with all of these uh, online dating things and everything else, you can't smell anything. <laughs> but it's probably a good thing. No, it's really interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting. I mean, it was a part of your whole presentation mm -hmm. and all the senses were there. We don't really pay attention to smell. Yeah, it's, it's like when you walk into someone's house and they've been baking cookies or baking mm -hmm. bread and just immediately you feel warm and invited and a little bit hungry, right? <laughs> it's, the scent is important. Yeah, actually, that's a, it's a part of taste as well. So that's very, very fascinating. I remember one year. Now, this is where how I digress. So just, you know, go with me here for a minute. When you talk about scents and you mm -hmm. walk into somebody's home, you smell something wonderful like bread or, mm -hmm. you know, apple pie. Yes. So warm and inviting. And when I was in grade three, my parents decided that they were going to make sauerkraut uh -oh. that year. Yeah. Let me just tell you, that was not, I did not bring any friends home for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that was not one of the pleasant scents. So I mm -hmm. do, it, it absolutely does matter. It really it does. does matter. It's fascinating. <laughs> um, that, that's really something else. Interesting. Thank you for that report. We appreciate it. Ryan, go ahead. Well, yeah, you know, we're finally at a winter here where I live in Southern Ontario, Canada. And you know, every year at this time, I just love watching nature sprout and flourish all over again. You know, it's absolutely amazing that the plants, flowers, trees, and grass without fail spring up year after year after year. But what's even more interesting is that the green leaves of spring and summer are really just a cover. Let's take a close-up look at these amazing machines. A time to be reaping, a time to be sowing. The green leaves of summer are calling me home. These are the famous lyrics from the song entitled Leaves of Green, which was written for the 1960 John Wayne film, The Alamo. However, it has been discovered that the green color of the leaves is actually just a cover. Indeed, although the beloved yellows, golds, reds, and purples are there, the green steals the show for the majority of the season. This is due to photosynthesis, a process where leaves convert carbon dioxide and sunlight into sugar and oxygen. The plants take the sugar and give us the oxygen. This process, however, could not happen without the microscopic green biomolecules called chlorophylls. John Upchurch explains that when sunlight strikes the chlorophyll molecules, they start vibrating and send out charged electrons that run the sugar-making factory. Chlorophyll is picky about which colors it uses, however. Sure, he says, sunlight seems pretty yellow to us, but it actually comes to Earth with a full spectrum of colors. Chlorophyll ushers the red and blue parts of the light right into making energy, but the green part bounces off. That scattered green finds its way to your eyes, and suddenly leaves look completely green to us. Once the trees begin to shut down their energy factories, however, they stop producing chlorophyll. It is not long until the green fades away and the other colors are revealed. Xanthophylls, carotenes, and the rarer anthocyanins are responsible for the yellows, oranges, and reds, respectively. These other behind-the-scenes colors, though unseen most of the time, also play important roles. For example, the yellow is thought to protect the leaves from the intense rays of the sun, while the orange limits oxygen's destructive effects. 
and the red pigment is believed to help the trees recover the last few nutrients from their leaves before winter. The question is, if these other pigments are so helpful, then why are they not visible all year long as well? Actually, this is a very important design feature. Indeed, out of all the colors, the darker green does the best job of collecting sunlight. However, the other colors also aid in boosting efficiency too, as they allow even more absorption of sunlight. This is one of the many stunning examples of the fine-tuning of planet Earth, which points directly to a creator. You know, from the reaches of the universe to the lowest part on the Earth, we see a whole lot of design. Today's example was just one leaf, but from that, we could see the careful and deliberate adjustments made in order for it to function to the best of its ability. Now, let's be honest here, this isn't any accident of nature. No, what we have here is just one of the many examples of the fine-tuned creation which the loving God of the universe has provided so that we all can have life and have it abundantly. But what's even more amazing is that even after our natural lives are over, he has still provided a way for us to live forever with him. Think about that for a minute. The God and creator of the entire universe has made a way for each and every one of us to live forever with him. He's done it through the work of Jesus Christ, God incarnate. God came in the form of a man, Jesus, and died for your sins and mine, and all we have to do is accept his work on the cross on our behalf and make him Lord of our lives. The question is, will you make the decision for Jesus today if you haven't already? Life is delicate, and you know what? Time is short. Time is short, and come to Christ today. We, we say that uh, Christ is as close as the mention of his name. Um, that's true, and he's waiting for you to respond. If you've never responded to Jesus Christ, this is your opportunity. And simply say, Lord, I, I believe that I need help with my sin, my awfulness that has just created problems. I need you to forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I believe you paid the cost of sin. And you rose again on the third day. And uh, you rose in the flesh. And I need you as Lord of my life. That's all you pray. And be sincere about it. And God will really touch you. Absolutely amazing. Call Christ into your life today. Ryan, I, I noticed that uh, you mentioned this in the piece. And the other, did that. this is fascinating to me. Because I'm thinking of, because I have solar cells. and Because I'm an yeah. engineer, you know. We have these things in my backyard, 19 antennas and everything else. Anyway, but green is the color that attracts the sun. Yeah, it's the most beneficial, right, for photosynthesis and everything. You know, and, and the trees, they create oxygen for us to breathe, you know. So trees are very, very important, you know. So we could learn a lot if we looked at nature, if we looked at these situations and say, well, how does this work for cleaning the earth or doing these things? How does nature do it? We can learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, and when you when people go around cutting down all the trees, you know it creates problems. You know that's why you get deserts and you get you get that because trees are very important. You know for the earth. Um, you know now I'm not I'm not against. You know you do cut down some trees for resources and God. I believe God gave us those things as well. You know that's how we get paper and that's how we get all all those things. But it's, it's important. Trees are very important. And the ark was made out of trees as well. And mm -hmm. there are many companies who cut down the trees, but then go and replant trees after that. It's very, mm -hmm. very important. That's right. You know, this is amazing. We learn so much from your two reports. And uh, this is one of the reasons we do it. It's excellent and uh, very good. All right. Remember this before I get to the question. I know you're ready for the weekend question. as well. We want to talk and the about the weekend, Corey. <laughs> right. Okay. So we have a signed reading because we are reading through the entire Bible this this year. So each week there is a signed reading that you are supposed to read, and as you're going along with us. But every Saturday morning, I release on my YouTube channel a chapter by chapter recap of all of that reading. So it gets you caught up if you've fallen behind, or if you just want to test yourself to see if you remember. So join me on my YouTube channel. It's my name, Corey. Bab uh, on YouTube. And yeah, I hope to see you there. I, I try to respond in the comments and answer questions and things as well uh, all weekend and sometimes during the week as well. So we'll very check it good. Out. And let me just say that we're working on getting that program. We're working on it uh, as, as a program on Bible Discovery TV Network. Very good. Janice. All right. Well, I'll tell you, 
It's not easy to get a question from the Psalms. I'm afraid it's not going to be easy and to answer it, a question it, it from the Psalms. It isn't. And so, you know, if you have, it, it, those of you at home, if you have your Bible in front of you, it is an open book test, of course. So you can take a look. It's <laughs> anywhere from Psalm 19. Ryan's like, I'm going to get my Bible. His. Yes, from 19 to Psalm 49. So in what Psalm do we read this? Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Is that in Psalm 26? <laughs> is that in Psalm 36? Or is that in Psalm 46? What say you both? Oh hmm. man. Okay, I I think it's in 36 or 46. I think it's the later ones. But... I'm not I'm not seeing it in 36, so <laughs> do, do it do quick, quick, quick look. Yeah, through. quick look. Mm. Oh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm not seeing it in. I 20, think I hear pages turning 26 at home either. as well. It's got to be the last one. Try 46. One. Yeah. Yeah. How much time do we have? Uh, we only have 36. Well, you know what? We could just guess 46. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go with 46. 46. All right. Well, actually, it's Psalm 36. Right. Oh, it is. Oh, I'm is your, sorry. Is your <laughs> I was trying to give you cues over here, but we're so far apart. Oh it's yeah, there it is. There it is, Ryan. There it is. You said, he said. I it's hard to be in the hot seat, you know. It is it's hard, hard to be you know? in the hot it seat. It is. It is very difficult. But Psalm 36, it's a wonderful passage. <laughs> Read it today. Today we come to you at the end of the program and we say thank you for joining us, but let's pray together, all of us. And let's pray, Lord, help me to tell others about you. Because Father, if there's one thing I can do, it's what you've called me to do. In fact, Lord, everybody who believes in you and everybody who's taken you as Lord, they're called to live their testimony and to speak what they believe about you to others. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.